So in Genesis chapter 20, we have uh, a repeat of this great proof of the truth of Holy Scripture. It's impossible to imagine that this story could have been made up. It's impossible to think that the Jews would say, let's make up a humiliating, embarrassing story about the father of our nation, about the founder of our race. And let's not only do it once, let's do it twice. Because in chapter 20, in a situation in a place called Gerar, uh, Abraham sins the same sin with Abimelech, the king of that place, which he, which he sinned with Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, in chapter 12. Now, think about it. In chapter 12, Abram was just getting to know God. He had just met God. He was just starting out on his walk with God. But in chapter 20, he had known God a long time. He had tested God's faithfulness. He'd seen God's power. He'd known God's provision. God preserved him during war and brought his, his nephew back. God introduced him to Melchizedek. God showed himself to him in the fire between the the pieces of the sacrificed animals in chapter 15. God had answered his prayer in the plea that he made with, with the man who visited his tent in, in chapter 18. God had delivered Lot and his daughters from death. God had done great things in his life for 24 years. And yet, he sins the very same sin that he sinned in chapter 12. I want to just talk about that for just a minute and, and ask how that could happen. In the New Testament, we have this great teaching on this business of the flesh and the spirit. In some places in the New Testament, the word flesh just means our body, our physical body. But in other places where the, the word is used in a more spiritual way, the flesh is that realm of independence from God. When we walk in the flesh, we use only the resources that we receive from the first Adam, who we are because we're born in the world. We will walk in the Spirit. We avail ourselves of the wonderful resources of the second birth. All we receive from the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. This great spiritual arsenal that we're given to fight the battles of God. But when we walk in the flesh, we're walking in disobedience. And we're walking in our own power. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul says in verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Now here's the thing we need to remember. Abraham had been walking with God for a long, long time, for 24 years. Here's what that means. If you've been a Christian for a long time and you decide to walk in the flesh, not in the Spirit, the fact that you've been a Christian for a long time doesn't do you any good. Think of what David did. How could the greatest man in the world, the man who wrote the Psalms, sin with Bathsheba and murder her husband? How could he do that? Well, he was walking in the flesh. I became a Christian this month, June, this week, 1971, almost 40 years ago, 39 years ago. And it's wonderful to have become a Christian, to have been a Christian for 39 years. But you know what? If I decide to walk in the flesh, the fact that I've been a Christian 39 years doesn't do me any good. You know why? 
because my flesh has not been getting better during those 39 years. My flesh, that person that I am without Christ, my flesh doesn't improve the longer I'm a Christian. So here's what that means. If I decide to walk in the flesh, not only am I capable of sinning sins as bad as the sins I committed in 1970, which is pretty bad, before I became a Christian, I'm capable of sinning sins worse than I committed in 1970. As a matter of fact, it's almost inevitable, it's almost guaranteed that if I walk in the flesh, I will commit sins worse than the sins that I committed before I became a Christian. You know why? Because those sins I committed in 1970 were sins of ignorance. They were sins in the darkness. If I walk in the flesh in 2010, the sins I commit, I commit in the light. They are sins in the light. They are sins against the light. They are sins against privilege. They are sins against someone who is my Savior and my friend and my Lord. When I sinned in 1970, I was sinning against somebody I didn't know. So, if we determine that we're going to walk in the flesh, that we're going to walk in our own will and not in God's will, that we're going to walk away from God, that we're going to do what we want to do, the fact that we've been Christians for a long time doesn't help us at all. In a way, it hurts us because it makes what we do so bad because we know so much and we've been given so much help and yet we sin anyway. Do you know that under the law there was no sacrifice for somebody who sinned deliberately? The sacrifices were because of sins that you didn't realize you were committing, sins of ignorance. There was no sacrifice for intentional sin, what we, what we in English call sins with a high hand, sins of defiance, sins on purpose, sins with full knowledge. So here we are in Genesis 20, and we find this man who'd walked with God for so long and now knew God so well doing exactly the same thing that he did in Genesis chapter 12. But you know what? It's even worse. It's even worse for another reason. Because this is the season that God has promised three times, once in chapter 17 and twice in chapter 18, this is the time she's going to get pregnant. So what does he do? He sends her to another man's bed. How stupid is that? How terrible is that? How outrageous is that? Chapter 20, verse 1. Abraham journeyed from there toward the land of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur. Then he sojourned in Gerar. We're still in the southwest of Israel, near the desert. And Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. So Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said, Behold, you're a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she's married. Now Abimelech had not come near her. He hadn't touched her. And he begins to pray, Lord, wilt thou slay a nation even though blameless? Did he not himself say to me, she is my sister? And God said, I know that. And I kept you from sinning against her. Now I give her back because he's a prophet. Because if you don't give her back, you're going to die. That's verse 7. So Abimelech got up early in the morning. He called his servants together and he told them what had happened. He told them what God had showed him. So then they called Abraham in in verse 9 and they said, why on earth did you do this to us? Now again, remember, if they made up the story, they not only made a story that made Abraham look bad, but they made up a story that made the Gentiles look good. What do the critics tell us? 
They tell us that these stories were made up to make the Jews look good. So we ask the question again, have these people who are supposed to be scholars even read the stories? Some of the stories, many of the stories, do the exact opposite. The Bible tells the truth. The Bible tells the truth even when the truth is humiliating, embarrassing to its greatest heroes. Why have you done this? Verse 10. Look at Abraham's excuses in verse 11. Because I thought you guys really didn't fear God and that you'd kill me because of my wife. And by the way, she really is my half-sister because we have the same father, but we don't have the same mother. And then look at what he says in verse 13. You know, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, I asked her to tell everybody that I was her brother. So almost in a way he's blaming God. You know, if we had stayed home, this wouldn't have happened. But we didn't stay home because God led us away. So Abimelech gives him great presents. Abraham prays, and evidently during this period, we don't know how long she was there, but they realized that while she was there that uh, nobody could conceive. Abraham prays. It's very interesting, isn't it? Verse 17, Abraham prayed to God. God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maids so that they bore children. For the Lord had closed fast all the wombs of the household of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. God prays that somebody else's wife gets pregnant, and they get pregnant. God's been praying for his own wife for 24 years, and he's waiting, waiting, waiting on the Lord. Well, I told you that a, a terrible thing happened and a good thing happened. Well, the good thing that happened was that God got him out of the situation again. But that really wasn't the good thing I was really talking about. The, the great thing happens in chapter 21. Chapter 21, the promise is fulfilled. Isaac is born. Isaac, who's not the son of Eliezer of Damascus, but the son of Abraham. Isaac, who's not the son of Hagar, but the son of Sarah. Isaac, the promised son, after the long, long wait. Chapter 21, verse 1, Then the Lord took note of Sarah as He had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as He had promised. God always does what He said. And God always fulfills His promise. You may not think so. And you may think He waits too long. But God always keeps His promises. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time Abraham named him Isaac. Abraham circumcised him, verse 4. And Abraham was a hundred years old, verse 5. And then a time comes when Isaac and Ishmael can no longer live together because there's conflict and Ishmael has to be driven out. Now, um, there's a great spiritual principle here that's developed again in the book of Galatians chapter 4, which has to do with two principles, the principles of law and slavery and the principle of grace and freedom. Ishmael represented law and slavery, and Isaac represents grace and freedom. And we're not going to take time to develop that theology, but you can read about it in Galatians chapter 4. But it's a sad thing and a hard thing. But although Ishmael grew up now without his father, look at verse 20. God was with the lad. God was with the lad. Even though he's no longer with his earthly father, he was favored by the heavenly father, and God was with him. 
Does this mean that Ishmael will be in heaven? I hope so. Okay. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com.